what happens if you die without a will? Well, here to talk with us about this is Mark Colgan from Montage Wealth Management and author of a book called Death's Red Tape. Mark, welcome. Yes, thank you, Bob. Nice to be here. It's a pleasure. So we're eager to have you walk us through um, what happens when you die without a will. And, and uh, maybe we start with what are the benefits of having a will? <laughs> yeah, of course. It's It's a great question. Well, I can share with you from personal experience, unfortunately, how this plays out. Um, you know, my my wife, uh, my first wife, died rather suddenly back in 2001, just a week before 9/11. And I, I'll I'll start with the emotional angle. W- what happens is, of course, you're you're overwhelmed with many many things to do. Uh, you're overwhelmed with grief and the and the loss of a loved one. In the midst of all of that, uh, you, you, the best thing you can have are instructions on how to how to settle things. And so the benefit of having a will is simply that it eliminates a lot of the guesswork about who's going to get what assets, right? Who's going to get the property, whether it's personal property or financial property. Um, it's already spelled out. And another benefit is it outlines who's that person that's going to be responsible for administering all of the things that need to be taken care of in that probate process. As you know, that would be the executor or executrix. So those those are a couple of benefits that really shine, particularly in a time where life can be pretty stressful. So in terms of the dangers of not having a will, there are lots of fact patterns that uh, could crop up in anyone's life. Someone might be, for instance, married with children. What happens then? Uh, well, yeah, if you, if you die without a will, i.e. intestate, then the courts have a lot of control over who gets what and, and how that's taken care of. So immediately right off the bat, you're in a position of no control or very little control. And so if you have children, well, I'll give you an example in New York State. Um, if if you die without a will and, and your spouse has children, their surviving spouse will keep 50,000 plus half of the assets and the rest go to the kids, right? So um, if your kids are of you know, 21 or older, um, you know, they're just going to get those monies. And there's not a lot of control there about the kids and how they're going to spend that money or how they're going to save it, how they're going to use it. Uh, And perhaps even more of a challenge sometimes is when you have younger children, then the courts have, they can't obviously give those monies directly to the children at that age. So they're going to create some type of system where the courts are going to control uh, you know, how that money is cared for and, and benefit of those children. Mm. So it's uh, it's obvious then it may be contrary to your wishes if it, if you're married with children and you die without a will. What about if you're married without children or grandchildren? Yeah, that that's a good question. That certainly happens as well. And in, in that case, it's pretty similar. Uh, but what happens is it'll the courts will look to either your parents or siblings. And where this can really create a problem is let's say let's say you have elderly parents and they're you know maybe they're in a situation where the level of their finances determine I don't know whether they qualify for Medicaid or maybe their level of finances determines whether or not they get uh, a property tax break. Like here in New York State, we have the enhanced star exemption and such. There's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of a domino effect. So if those monies are left up to the parents, that could have unintended consequences you never even thought of. Um, And then, of course, same thing if it's going to your siblings. We don't know their financial circumstances. So is that money going to be of benefit to them? In in the end, it probably will, but it may carry with it some challenges that they didn't really welcome. Yeah. And some folks are single with children? All of that money is going randomly to someone that's going to, uh, you know, handle that money in the best interest of your children. But as we all know, there's a lot of family dynamics with pretty much everybody in life. And, and so while the courts may deem 
uh, a particular individual the best person to be that trustee to manage the money and for the benefit of the children uh, you may have thought otherwise while when you were alive you would have thought to yourself geez I, I know this person really well on the surface they appear to be the best solution but we all know that that individual has issues with blank so I think I'm gonna have someone else as the trustee well you don't have that control because you didn't you didn't describe that thoroughly in the will or create any kind of details in a trust yeah and what's the danger for someone who's single with no children or grandchildren well then it's going to go most likely by the courts and of course I, I will preface this by saying that um, every state can be different so some of the um, vagueness that I'm sharing with you is specifically because um, you know it, it could be different from New York State than to North Carolina etc but in likelihood it would go to um, that closest relative which could be the parents and then uh, the last fact pattern is uh, or you know, two last fact patterns unmarried couples and uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about domestic partners as well but first unmarried couples uh, so unmarried couples can really leave your loved one in a lurch because you're not married. So there's no legal connection there. Um, let's say you've been living with someone for, I don't know, 10 years and you, you live together as if you're married, right? There's a lot of people that have wonderful relationships that aren't technically married but um, live, you know, dependent on one another and they have a great life together well if that person dies then you know all bets are off that money may not even go to your loved one it may go to perhaps your brother who maybe doesn't even have a good relationship with your spouse or uh, once again it's that lack of control so now that one person that's financially dependent on you is left in in, in a, a financial lurch because you didn't think through the idea of having all of this done in writing ahead of time. Right. Um, so, and it's possible that this property is what then distributed among um, uh, uh, relatives, uh, whatever, right? Aunts, uncles, cousins, perhaps. Yes. Or, yeah. Absolutely. You're a hundred percent right. Right. Again, probably not what someone intended. What about domestic partners? What are the, what's the danger there of not having a will? That's an area that's evolving even as we speak because, um, you know, there's some laws passing federally that are finally um, observing that um, domestic partners would be considered the same as a marriage. So um, in some of those circumstances, the domestic partner would receive the money just as if they were a married couple, um, a traditional married couple. So uh, luckily that's starting to work through the system so that they don't have that same lurch that someone uh, otherwise would if they weren't married. Yeah, so we've discussed the benefits of having a will, the dangers of not having a will. Now people are probably asking, okay, I need to set up a will, how do I go about this? Uh, there are some steps that people need to follow? I, I do believe so, yes. Um, you certainly can do this online. And quite frankly, there are a couple of great services out there that, that provide guidance and such, but it's my personal opinion that the the extra cost associated with hiring an individual attorney uh, is well worth the investment. The way I see it is you've got one chance of getting this right. You, you can't go back and, and edit things later. So um, the other thing is there's a, a, a number of nuances and things that you may not think of if you're just clicking online. Uh, so hiring a what I call a trust in a state attorney or a T&E attorney I think is a smart move because she or he would be um, you know doing these types of things on a regular basis and hopefully a little bit more specialized in knowing the details around creating the right estate plan whether it include just the standard will health care proxy and power of attorney or perhaps some additional layers of complexity that may involve trusts. Right. And among the steps is obviously communicating your wishes to uh, your loved ones uh, and letting them know who your attorney is. I think those would be important things to, to take into account. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I'm going to underscore that twice. It It's great to have a will. I think it's absolutely necessary. But why not communicate that to, to your loved ones, right? So I always recommend that you have a family meeting 
and that family meeting uh, is where you sit down in a living room perhaps, whether it's maybe guided by a financial advisor like myself, or maybe you just take care of it yourself. Either way, have that open dialogue with your children about um, you know, what your wishes are, what your last wishes are, who's going to get what, et cetera. Um, you know, some people are private and they don't, they don't want to share that kind of detail and that's okay. You don't have to get into a lot of detail, but at least sit down with folks and help them understand, okay, at the very minimum, this is the attorney that we entrusted. Here's generally how this is going to work and here's the location of the documents. Um, I think that that is critical because, um, you know, in the absence of that, people are going to be scrambling it after your death. Yeah. So it also occurs to me that having a will and a trust and estate attorney is one component of a comprehensive financial plan. Incorporating that into a plan might require talking to a financial planner who can see the big picture of how your will and wishes fit in with your entire financial plan. Yes, it, it, that's a good point. Uh, you know, a lot of financial planning things are more connected, almost like in nature. Um, you know, you you affect one thing, and unbeknownst to you, something else is affected. Uh, financial planning is like that a lot too. It's almost a web of challenges. Let me give you just like a, a for instance. Let's say um, you know you choose. Let some someone has a you know, a $5 million IRA or a million dollar IRA, doesn't matter the balance so much as if they have one daughter or one sibling and they leave all of that money to that person upon death, then they're going to have to liquidate that over a 10 year period. And that sudden cash flow to that individual, while be it a, a wonderful gift, let's, you know, but at the same time, it could create an, an unexpected tax problem. If you talk through that with your financial planner, you might discover that there's an opportunity to use perhaps a life insurance solution to offset those taxes to mitigate the tax challenge that would be associated with your death had you not spoken with a financial planner to discover that opportunity. Yeah. And the last thing I think I'll mention is this notion of once you create a will, it's not a set and forget it kind of thing. You need to review it after life events or certainly we know that there are state law changes coming in the next couple of years or so. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, of course. It's a, it's a good point. I would say that the the catalyst is, in fact, a life event, right? You've, you, you got everything written. It seems like it's perfect. But God forbid you have, uh, let's say, a health scare or you know you have um, the family dynamics change, whether it be something that's involving drama, or whether it's something involving re- opportunity, like um, you know maybe it's a, a a new birth, right? It could be things that are positive too, but every time some of those events occur, it can't hurt to go back and just check the will. The other thing I often recommend is that these family meetings. They can be done every year. And I always like to give as an example Thanksgiving, wonderful time because everybody's typically getting together with their family. And, you know, perhaps it's just before or just after that family gathering where you take an hour to sit down as a family and discuss not only that, but a lot of the positives that could you know, the conversations I see will often um, steer into philanthropy and how they can give some of the money to charities that they believe in. So, Mark, we've covered a lot of ground. Anything we missed or anything that just bears reemphasizing, perhaps? Uh, no, I, I think that the, the one thing that, you know, is pretty obvious from our discussion is that you just need to get it done. And uh, unfortunately, it's a Somewhere in the 50% range of, of, of folks don't actually get around to it because they know it's important, but they have no urgency. So they just table it and they just table it. In reality, getting a good estate plan put together is not as difficult as you may think. It's picking up the phone call, making an appointment with the attorney, following their process, and typically within a few meetings, you're all set. So my urgency to you is while you're healthy, while you've got a clean, clear state of mind, rather, uh, I would say that's the best time to go ahead and get all of this taken care of. Yeah, and I can speak from personal experience. There's a lot of peace of mind that comes with knowing that your estate plan, your will is all buttoned up and that it will and that things will happen according to your wishes uh, should you, you know, 
um, should you die. So uh, it, it's it's well worth doing. I, I'll uh, I'll underline what you've said about doing it and not uh, not delaying. So, so Mark, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. It's a it's a great treat, and I know many viewers benefited greatly from uh, listening to your sure. remarks. Okay, Bob. Thanks a lot. It's great talking with you. I hope we'll be on another uh, session.